Tell me about your mom and dad. You know, did, were they an influence on you? Oh, absolutely. My mom and dad, uh, neither one went to college. My dad never even made it to high school. My dad was a welder, a tool and die welder. My mom was a, a cook. There was a re restaurant in the Dunkirk Fredonia area called The Vineyard. Mm -hmm. She was the specials chef for the afternoons. Taught me how to cook, which is why I became a good cook and why I do most of the cooking still at our house. Uh, it, and you know, they always encourage, you have to go to college, you have to go to college, you have to go to college. And then the interesting part was I had a US Navy ROTC scholarship. Okay. So I was limited to the colleges to which I could apply. And one of them was Penn State. And they said, absolutely. I actually wanted to go to Wisconsin, but they talked me into Penn State, which is a decision I'm glad they made for me. But nonetheless, uh, they pushed college real hard. I thought my father was going to kill me when I declined the NROTC scholarship and they had to pay for me out of state rates. Uh, so there were a bit of student loans here and there, but they encouraged me all the way through. Uh, they helped me get jobs, my summer jobs. I worked in a steel mill for three years. I worked at the Ford plant in Buffalo for a year, or that summers, and made a ton of money doing that because I was making steel worker wages, I was making auto worker wages, so that helped with the college too. And then the interesting part about college, I don't know if this is your next question or not, but I'm, I want to go be a history professor. I was a history major. I love American history. I've probably been to every Civil War battlefield site east of the Mississippi. Just love it. I ask my family about it. They're not so happy about it. But nonetheless, we go and do that. So I want to be a, a history professor. So I go to my advisor and I say, Professor Maddox, that was my advisor, and said, these are my grades. You, well, you know my grades. You had me in class a couple of times. These are my grades. These are my GREs. What schools do you think I can get in? And he said, well, you aren't going to have any trouble getting into most any of them. These would be the ones I'd suggest. But he said, think about it. And I said, think about what? I know what I want to do. And he said, here is an announcement for Bowling Green University for an American history professor. It came out yesterday. They've already had 30 applications and they expect more than 200 before it's done. That's your competition. Is that what you really want to do? And I walked away discouraged. We had a close knit group of friends and one of them says, you know, you really like to talk. Why don't you take the, the LSATs? I always did real well on standardized tests, the SATs, the GREs, you name it, the standardized tests I did well. I did real well on the LSATs too. So I said, well, you might as well apply to law school. So I applied to four law schools, UB, University of Wisconsin, Penn, uh, University of Illinois, which is where I went, and UCLA, which is where I wanted to go. That's the only one I didn't get in. But U of I, at the time, had just hired a professor who had just been the dean of the University of Buffalo Law School. His name was Bill Hawkland. And I'm thinking, they're probably a better school, and it was actually cheaper out of state at the U of I than it was in state at UB. And I'm thinking, there's no decision here. So I went to the University of Illinois. And I, I'll go for a year and then figure out what I want to do. And then after the first year, it's a, well, you know, I finished a year of law school, might as well take the second. Then I take the second, and then it's a, well, you know, now I'm this far, I might as well take the third, and then I take the third. And then, of course, you graduate, you take the bar exam. I pass the bar exam, and I go out looking for a job. I actually found Did you one. Did New York and Illinois? No, I took New York's later. I planned on, I, I had a girlfriend that was fairly serious, not my wife now, and we broke up long, long ago, long before I got married. But anyway, we were fairly serious at the time, and I got a job offer. I didn't take it. Will County Public Defender's Office, which is a little bit west, the county due west of Chicago. And then I thought about it and I said, no, you know, I think I might want to head back because things weren't going too well with Paula and I, that was her name. So I came back here and then took the New York bar, had a little trouble finding a job. I wound up as Dunkirk City Clerk, uh, which was kind of an interesting thing, but not, it was, I got to meet some lawyers, got to meet some professional people, it was really nice. Then there was an opening at the Chautauqua County DA's office. Paul King was the DA. Paul was a graduate of Northwestern Law. I'm a graduate of U of I Law. We're both admitted to the Illinois Bar, and to him, there was no further need to go. Uh, we were kindred souls, brothers in the law practice of Illinois, so he hired me as an ADA. And the rest is history from there. So, was there any question that, that you know, once you got to the University of Illinois, that Dunkirk area would be the draw, because that's where your mom and dad were. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, I had no intentions of coming back whatsoever. 
Uh, actually, when I did come back, my brother lived up in Lockport at the time, so I stayed with him. He worked in Lockport, had a job there, and he lived in a place called Williamstown, which I think is now senior housing in the town of Amherst. And I stayed with him there, and then this thing in Dunkirk came up, and I go, well, you know, it's a job. It's going to pay me something while I find my real true calling and get myself a real job. And then again, Paul had an interview. He called me and said, would you be willing to come up for an interview? I was. I did. And I said, you know, this sounds like fun, and it's been fun ever since. So at the time, put me in a time frame, you would have, you would have been back to Dunkirk about when? Uh, I came back in September maybe of 19, I graduated in June of 73 from law school. I had to stay there for the bar, took the bar review course. So that took me through the summer. The bar exam, I think, oh, I remember the bar exam. It was in DePaul Law School in Chicago, unair-conditioned on the eighth floor. It was miserably hot. But that would have been, I believe, in September, and I stuck around for a little bit, and I had my girlfriend out there. I think I probably came back in maybe November, and then I went up with my brother, and then this thing with the city clerk came up in June of 74, and I took it and, and taken the bar exam, so I knew I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I was city officer until Paul offered me the job in the summer of 76. So Paul had been elected DA. He had been. Four-way race. Pardon? Four-way race. I, I, I vaguely remember that. And, uh, and then, uh, of course, died tragically. Uh, were you at the assistant DA at that time? I was. Yeah. That was a sad time. That was a real sad time. And everybody had the utmost respect for Paul. He was an easy man to work for, a good mentor, knew the law, had a great temperament. Uh, it, it's just one of those tragic things that there was truly somebody that was taken well before he should have been. He was 39 at the time. Oh, wow. Uh, Paul, when he got the office, who else was in the office with you? Not many people. Yeah. Ron Gibb was there, and Ron, of course, was an ADA under me when I became DA. Uh, Bob Seidel, Bob is now passed, of course. He was an ADA for a long time. And Bill Foley, of course. Bill is still around. He's still up in the Dunkirk area. Yeah, yeah I mean, Bill is still around. And I'm trying to think if there was, any, oh, John Ward. That was, we were the entire office. And John was, not, John was my mentor. I got to follow him around to the justice courts he handled. So my first responsibility there was handling justice courts and misdemeanors, traffic infractions, and things like that. So you're out a lot of nights. Oh, all the time, all the time. But I didn't mind it. I was single. So going out at night gave me something to do. It kept me out of trouble. I'd be out. Pretty much every court was a night court back then, and a lot of them still are, I believe, but at that time almost all of them were because the justice court system deals with a salary, if there's any at all, so low that no one could possibly live on it. So all of these people had to have jobs, and their jobs were almost always during the day, so court would be held at night. So I'd be heading off into town of Sheridan, town of Hanover, town of Westfield, town of Ripley, Stockton, Pomfret, Dunkirk, you name it. I'm out there and almost everyone was at night. But it was fun. I got to meet a lot of really nice people, got to learn a lot about courtroom procedures, how to handle yourself in a courtroom, and the law itself, believe it or not, even in justice court. Well, speaking of which, uh, there over time, we all had an opportunity to be in that court, even I. Uh, and so you got to know some of the characters who were judges. Mm -hmm. Were there a couple that stood out in your mind saying, you know, as just judges? Because they didn't have to be lawyers. They didn't have to necessarily go through all the training. Very few of them were. And then maybe I'm going to offend some that might be listening or seeing that were judges and lawyers at the same time. I found that the best town, village, and city judge well, not city judges, but town and village justices were non-lawyers, were lay people, because not only did they have the law with which they had to contend, it was common sense. Mm -hmm. They had life's experiences behind them. They would understand that some kid, which was always my philosophy when I was DA, you get some 16-year-old kid that gets in a little bit of trouble, who's had no problems before, you can permanently scar that person with what you do with them and how you do it. And I know it sounds strange because there's things like youthful offender, but there are always things that can come back and bite you at some point. So you 
treat them a little bit differently, they'd have that degree of common sense and say, you know, we need to handle this one a little bit differently. And the lawyer judges wouldn't see that. They'd say the law is X, he did Y, therefore the conclusion is Z. And sometimes that's the way it needed to be. But oftentimes it was the facts are X, the law is Y, but maybe the conclusion needs to be A and B and C and not be Z at all. And that I thought was very telling. Now, for example, Ed Jackson in the town of Ellicott. Ed was a wonderful judge with a wonderful common sense, a wonderful man, and it was really sad when we lost him. Rudy Halicki in the town of Dunkirk was a guy that I'm sure didn't have, if he had a high school degree, that would surprise me. But same thing, had the most common sense you could ever believe. And sometimes they weren't afraid to buck the DA the assistant DA at the time, I mean, if I'm doing defense work, they weren't afraid to buck the assistant DA. If I was the assistant DA, they weren't afraid to buck me. It's a, you know, I don't think we ought to do it that way. I think this would be better. And you'd look at it and you'd say, you know, I'm not sure that's the case. And you'd reflect on it a day, a week, a month, or even a year later and say, you know, that is the way it should have been. Things came out the way they should have been everything worked out well. And that's what I miss about that stuff. That's one of the things I still miss. I've been retired for over five years now. What do I really miss? Being in town courts, kibitzing with all the judges, the court personnel, the other lawyers, occasionally people that are there for other reasons, uh, and missing town court, city court, village court trials. I love doing that stuff. I miss, I miss being in a courtroom. I don't miss so much the paperwork that led to getting into the courtroom, but I loved being in a courtroom. I love trying cases. On the other side, we're often uh, certain attorneys you'd see all the time. All the time. When I, when I, you know, and some of those I, that may come to mind, like the Charlie Lovelands or the Bruce Carpenters, again, characters unto themselves. That they were, absolutely they were. Now, Charlie was just a wonderful man. I always enjoyed talking to Charlie, and it would be, what color is his tie really? Because there'd usually be about four layers of food on it. <laughs> <laughs> and the, so same, the same thing on his clothes. And you go, oh my God, I, I, mean, I can't believe this. He and I went up to Albany together because we were both interviewing when the DA's position came open after the election of 92. And same thing, Charlie looked cleaner than he normally did, but a brilliant man, believe it or not. A very compassionate man, very knowledgeable man. And he's just, eccentric for lack of a better term he had his foibles we all do i have mine too but his were a little more visible i guess than most people's but just a wonderful man john goodell would dress i mean it, almost like he came from the circus because he'd have like a purple plaid jacket and green plaid pants and a yellow plaid shirt and you go oh my god what circus did he just come from same thing though a brilliant man knew how to do cases knew his way around the courtroom and you watch those people I don't think I ever asked anyone, how do you do this? Why do you do that? I watched and I said, you know, I like the way he did that. I like the way she did this. And you adapt your style to include those types of practices within your own. And I think it makes you a better lawyer. So when you have that many lawyers in so many courts practicing law in so many different ways, that if you really sit there and concentrate on what's going on, you can't help but become a good lawyer. Uh, Paul King passes away, therefore there's a vacancy. How did that next level work? Uh, actually, what happened was John Ward was petrified that uh, Bill Foley was going to run because Bill has always been a popular fellow no matter where he's been. Nobody could ever question Bill's credentials. And I think what happened was is Bill recognized that you no know, private practice is very lucrative and being DA is not. So he decided not to run. The governor appointed Dave Civilette from Dunkirk, and John ran against him and won re rather handily. So that's how that came about. You were assistant DA during that interim period. I remember that. And uh, was that awkward? No, I didn't think so. John was always my friend. Dave was too. In fact, Dave and I had gone to the Mardi Gras a couple years before that, which was a lot of fun too, by the way. But that's a different story. Uh, but I liked John better as a lawyer. I thought John did better as an assistant DA and DA. Dave was kind of hesitant. I think it's because he was unfamiliar and maybe a little uncomfortable with the position. But one of the things, if you're doing criminal law, timidity is not a trait you should ever possess. You need to be ready to go full out 
within the bounds of ethics and within the bounds of the law, but you need to be able to and ready to go full out. And I saw a little hesitation with Dave every time he'd do something. He'd be, no, I'm not sure he's going to make the best DA, so I supported John. Okay. So John gets elected. You stayed on as the ADA. Mm -hmm. um, did things change at all? Did you see in the management of uh, the office? or did it kind of No, it was pretty much a continuum. of. Uh, it changed a little because Dave took over. And for that period of time, which would have been maybe four to six months, he was there. But then I think John pretty much adopted the Paul King style, which was make sure you do your job, make sure you're where you're supposed to be, make sure everything gets done when it needs to get done. Be kind, be courteous, be tough when you need to be tough, be compassionate when you need to be compassionate, but left you alone to do your job, which is the way it really needs to be. That was always my philosophy when I was DA. You know, if you do your job, then you're doing fine. And uh, I don't know that uh, John had no problem because I was the opposite political party of he. Uh, and that's something I followed through with. My entire career as DA, which was 12 plus years, I never asked anyone for their political affiliation. I never asked anyone for a transcript of their law school grades. To me, a work ethic was far more important than what their grades were in law school. I actually hired one ADA who I, was, he just worked his butt off on everything he did. And there was another one who had better education, I'm sure better grades in law school. Uh, it was more articulate, better dressed, but he set me off the first time by saying, I'm gonna be an hour late for my job interview because I've got a real estate closing and I'm thinking, your biggest client is going to be the DA's office and you're blowing it off before you even get the job. <laughs> So he didn't get the job, I hired the other one, and he did, he worked his tail off, and that's what I was looking for. I think everybody appreciates somebody that works hard for you. Everybody appreciates that no one is ever going to win every case. I won most of my cases at the end of my career, but nonetheless, you never win all of them. There's sometimes the facts are so stacked against you, you just have to make sure your client gets a fair trial, whether the client be the state or be a personal individual. So during that time period that uh, you're the ADA, and even probably when you're DA, the uh, county court judge was one Lee, Lee Town, Town Adams. Adams. What an interesting fellow he was. Yeah, he it. always tried to get me to marry his daughter and then have a child, and it, the child was going to be called Jamestown Adams Subject. And I go, no, that, <laughs> that, that, that's not going to happen, judge. But nonetheless, he, brilliant, brilliant man. I'm not sure how many people I've met that were more brilliant than Lee Town Adams. He and I were opposite political sides as well, which came out, by the way, when I ran for DA. But prior to that time, when I was an ADA or when I was in court as a private defense attorney, treated me with the utmost respect. I mean, you could learn a ton from him. Just a brilliant man, also very eccentric. Uh, one of the tightest individuals I've ever seen. I don't know if that was genetic or he just refused to part with a quarter, <laughs> but he would go to the Forestville Hotel. Occasionally you'd go there and he'd be sitting at the end of the bar reading a book with a beer that he would nurse. Genesee. Yep, forever. Yeah. And until somebody said, hey, judge, can I buy you a drink? And then, by God, he was ready to have another one. But uh, he, he was not the biggest spender I've ever seen, but learned a ton from him as well. Give me your best story. I mean, there were so many of them, but... Oh, my God. They've all talked. They've all, by the way, all your predecessors at this interview have got a story or two about them. Judge Adams? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I, I, I could tell tons of them about... Well, first of all, I don't know if you knew he read at my wedding. I wanted him to preside at my wedding wow. instead of having a priest. My wife was insistent on a priest, so we had to have a priest, but he, he did that at our wedding. We had some interesting cases together. He found I was kind of foisted. John was running for election, and there was a really nasty, criminally negligent homicide case. I'd never tried a felony case before, and John said, I can't do this, because everyone knew it was a loser. The defendant had already waived his right to jury trial because he already had been told by Judge Adams what the result was going to be. But there I was trying the case and Judge Adams treated me very well throughout the case until the verdict. And he says, you know, if you had charged him with this, and I had nothing to do with the charging, but if you had charged him with this, I might have found him guilty with that, but I can't find the defendant guilty of criminally negligent homicide. Uh, he, he was just wonderful through, throughout the trial though. He impart in vice. Uh, some of the stories I could tell, I just won't. Let's yeah. put it that way. 
You have that discretion? Yes. <laughs> so, and again, along that time, there were some, also some, some cases that Jim's subject is, is well, let me just go continue on your, your league career. You're assistant DA, and then at some point, you decide to throw your hat in as DA. 1992. Actually, I was talked into it. I wasn't really interested in doing it at that point. And I thought there are a couple things going against me. I said, you know, a Democrat, which is what my political affiliation was at the time, still is, I'm not afraid to admit it. No one has ever won. In the history of the county, no Democrat has ever won the election. I don't know how I can, but let's see what happens. So I decided to throw my hat. I got appointed actually by Mario Cuomo, not Andrew, uh, Andrew's father, Mario Cuomo appointed me the DA of the county somewhere in early January of 93. I had to gear up for the election. Uh, it was an interesting well, experience. What happened? John gone up to the county? John went up to county court. Uh, Lee Town couldn't run again, so John did. John won and he had to leave the position as DA because he obviously couldn't do both, so it's open and I got appointed. I can't remember, Bill Foley may have been the acting DA at the time, but he wasn't interested in the position at all. Again, he wasn't interested in it when he could have won it easily. He wasn't interested in it in this point either. So at that point he had a son, David, who's now the county court judge, right. that he's nurturing along as a young lawyer as well. So I decided to get into it. I ran against, you talked about John Goodell, I ran against one of my ADAs, Rick Goodell. Uh, interesting story about him. In fact, John Zorowski and I and Paul Andrews had lunch th today. We were talking about Rick. And he, he, Rick, or Paul said, I can still remember in the hallway when you fired Rick. Rick came to me and said, Jim, how would I measure my career if I decided to run against you? And I said, in seconds. <laughs> so <laughs> later that day, he announces for DA. I called him in and said, Rick, guess what? And he says, what? You're fired. And he says, you can't do that. And I said, oh, yes, I can. You're an at-will employee. I'm not going to have you in the office. He says, I've already talked to all the other ADAs, and they said they'd have no problem with the two of us running for the same office within the same office. And I said, you know what? It's funny because I talked to those same people, and they said it would be miserable. I'm going to take my side of it. You're gone. He's the only ADA who left. I never thought ADAs were there permanently, that we never paid enough money to keep most of them permanently. Some stayed, which was good, but not all of them. I always let them keep the badge. We always got a badge to carry. He's the only one I asked for it back. I mean, I, I also, and people are probably gonna hate this, but I had my choice. John Schwanekamp from Personnel calls, I can human relations now, but he, Personnel at the time says, Jim, you have two choices. And I said, what's that? And he says, you can either let Rick have all of his benefits, and all of his accrued vacation, all of his accrued sick time, all of this other stuff, or you can say he's not entitled to any of it. And I said, He's not entitled to any of it, so he didn't get any of it. I, I, I didn't feel bad about it. We, I, I, I ran a different campaign. He ran his campaign, and I, it worked on my behalf. Everything he did, I had some kind of answer for. He had a list of lawyers. He said, these lawyers all support me for DA. And I'm sure they did. Some of them, although I talked to some of them, they said, no, they just asked me to do it. I said, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't support anybody. But anyway, he did that. and. But in the meantime, I had gotten the support of every police agency, state, county, and local that endorsed that year. So he said, I've got all these people. And I said, well, that's interesting, Rick. This is in the middle of one of our debates. I said, now, you out there who are the voting public, you, somebody is breaking into your house. Who are you going to call? Are you going to call a divorce lawyer or are you going to call a cop? He has the support of the divorce lawyers. I have the support of the cops. And then I'm sure you remember the Hornberg tire dump. Yes. I represented the Hornberg tire dump. Everything they threw at Dave Hornberg, I fended off somehow. They sent the attorney general after him. They brought civil lawsuits, lawsuits by the DA's office at the time. Everybody is after Dave Hornberg, and I got him off of everything. And he maintained his tire dump. And he says, and he supports the Hornberg tire dump. He represents him. And I said, yes, and isn't that the type of lawyer you want as your DA? Somebody that's going to fight to the extent that something that, that unpopular as that still sits there because of your legal efforts. And it went that way throughout the entire campaign. The interesting part was, I came from the North County, I came from Dunkirk, Fredonia, but I lived in Jamestown at the time. The, the supposedly, I don't know if this is true or not, but the supposed political wisdom was, 
for a Democrat to win in the county, they had to carry Jamestown. And of course, we lived in Jamestown, so we were at the Jamestown headquarters first, and I had wound up losing Jamestown by like 200 votes, and I'm thinking, oh God, I'm gonna get my rear end handed to me here. So I said, look, we're gonna go back up to the north end. That's where I grew up. These are my people. We're gonna see what happens. So as we're driving home, we get to about Casadega, and I hear, I can't remember which, of Dan Fisher, but any one of the local guys say, well, the DA's race is still very close. Jim Subject's up a little. I'm thinking, what are they drinking? What are, what are they smoking? Well, they couldn't possibly be the same thing. Uh, they, I lost Jamestown. I must be losing the county by thousands. I get to the Dunkirk headquarters, and I carried the city three to one in Dunkirk. I carried the town of Pomfret, the town of Dunkirk, about the same way, and most of the northern end. I lost Ripley by a little. I lost Westfield by like 13, and the rest of the northern end of the county I carried. Plus, I carried Stockton and one other northern township, and I wound up winning the election by 1,100 votes. Talk about surprised, yeah, yeah. but it was great. I and just the first Democrat, first Democrat ever. There's been one since, but he's since lost his election this past yeah. year, I believe. But, yeah. but it was fun. I always enjoyed being DA. I, I thought I instituted a lot of policies, which probably or I hope are still in place to this day. Uh, things got. Things got done, things went real well. Uh, the police loved me, at least for uh, while I was there. Of course, then I had fun with them afterwards. But even afterwards, and I, I'm kind of diverging a little bit here, even afterwards, when we go to a trial and the police officer wasn't prepared, and of course, to me, that's the success of good trial work, it's preparation. Preparation, preparation, preparation. You, for cross-examination, you're on the other side and you're testifying, I know what you're going to say before you say it. So what the pro proper cross-examination, and you hear too much of the, and then what happened? And then you said this happened, then what happened? You've just made the other side's case by repeating the good stuff again. It's when you say something a little bit different than what you've written here or what you said there in another proceeding that you take and you go a little bit slow and a little bit quicker and the next thing you know, they're so far down the road they can't get back. So that would, to me, would be the secret of success for doing stuff like that. But I had a ball doing it. Can you articulate a few things that you might have implemented? Because here you are, it's a change of administration. You know, you're coming in fresh slate, 1993, mm -hmm. I guess. And, um, you know, can you name a few things that you, you implemented? Yeah, the first thing I did, actually it's something John Ward started when he was DA, but he didn't stick with it, was a quarterly newsletter which I thought was important and the police loved it. And what the quarterly newsletter would be, and I'd go hand deliver it to all the police agencies so they knew who I was and I could talk with them and find out whatever concerns they may have had. But it had all the changes in the case law, all the changes in the statutory law, changes within our office, changes of policy, changes of assignments. For example, lawyer A no longer is handling the city of Jamestown, lawyer B is, that type of stuff. And that would be usually four or five pages long and I'd bring that in literally faithfully every quarter while I was DA. The next thing I did, which I thought was the best thing I did, now I take that back, there, so I'll get to those. The next thing I did was a witness training program. Mm -hmm. That I thought was terrific and all the police did too. In fact, I had one deputy. His wife was a, I won't say where, but she might still be a, a town justice somewhere and she said, my husband wants you to call him and I just beat him in trial because he wasn't prepared and I'm thinking, oh God, he's gonna shoot me or do something. So I called him and I said, hey, so-and-so, what's up? And he says, I want you to think, I don't want you to think I'm a boob, that I'm not always that bad. And I said, what were you thinking of? Were you sleeping during my witness training program? And he said, I started five months after you left. I didn't go to it. <laughs> but they sat through it and I'll tell you what we did. It was a full day procedure. I limited it to somewhere between eight and 12 officers from all the agencies, state police, sheriff's department, local agencies, and we held them probably once every two or three months. The morning session was always a discussion of what you can do to make yourself a better witness, how you answer questions. If you've made a mistake, correct the mistake. Don't let it fester, which is what that deputy I told you about did. Yeah. He knew he made a mistake, but he never corrected it. And I said, why didn't you correct it if you knew you made the mistake? He says, I didn't think I could. And I go, Oh my God. So anyway, and that's what, that was the fatal flaw in that case. The case got thrown out because of that mistake. So anyway, that would be the morning. We do, this is what you do to be an effective person on the witness stand. Don't dress in cowboy boots. Don't have jewelry. This is an old veneer panel of jurors here. 
They're not real wild about earrings, nose rings, eyebrow rings. I don't care what you do in your home. When you're testifying before a court, you either wear your police uniform or a suit and a tie. You always have your shoes signed. Everything is to be proper. You, and you don't argue. Anyway, there was a whole thing we did that. And then I said, I want you to submit any case you've been on. It has to be your own case, but you submit it. And you know they were picking the cases that they were the most comfortable with. This is an airtight case. And we'd get them about a week in advance. Paul Andrews was usually on the other side. He'd do the prosecution part. And then I'd cross-examine them. And every one of them was shocked at all the things that they hadn't thought about mm. that all of a sudden was, you know, I should have done this differently. I should have done that differently. Everyone realized their airtight case wasn't so airtight. It probably was going to lead to an acquittal, not a conviction. The thing I'm probably the most proud of, and it was difficult to do, uh, Richard Slater, who I have the most utmost respect and admiration, was the public defender at the time. I wanted a treatment court. And he said, no, that's just an excuse to get people to plead guilty. And I said, it's not that at all. I, the war on drugs was lost years before, trillions of dollars before. That approach to the war on drugs is never going to work. I don't care how much money you put in it. I don't care how many people you arrest. I don't care how many people you put in prison. That approach is never going to work. So what we need is a treatment court. And Kevin became, Kevin Lomber became the public defender. And he says, yeah, let's go. So we went up to see Judge Doyle. And he says, well, absolutely, we'll get something set up. And we set it up in John Lyman Cusso's court in the city of Jamestown. And I still have a picture of getting some award for starting the drug court, which was really nice from um, Sharon Townsend. She was the administrative law judge at the time. So that worked out real well. I think it's been a success. It's been expanded. Does it work for every individual? Absolutely not. There is no course of treatment that is going to work for every individual. You're not going to save every individual from every addiction or uh, quirk or whatever it is that they have. But even if you save one, and the success rate was far greater than that, but even if you save one, it's well worth it. They wind up with a much better disposition. They wind up with a chance to redeem themselves, to clean themselves up, become productive members of society, and a number of them did. You'd be surprised how many people would see me on the street and say, I really want to thank you for what you did. Uh, it was. It was. It still is. Uh, kind of interesting. It wasn't a drug court grad, but I was here for about two minutes and I ran into somebody I knew. The first place we stopped in Chautauqua County was a little place in Barcelona, a restaurant there. And it was, it was Cameron Monroe. He runs the marina there. And I go, Cam? He says, Jim? And says, we started talking about it. He wanted to hire me. And he says, no, I'm, I'm not here anymore. I, but anyway, uh, that people all the time saying that and doing that was very rewarding. The victim impact panel on DWIs that forced somebody to sit through, and I don't know how the people that were the panel themselves got through it. I'm not sure I have the courage to be able to do something like that, but they've all lived through some type of tragedy, the loss of a child, a spouse, a parent, somebody close to them as a result of a careless DWI accident. And they'd sit through that. And the same thing, people would just sit there in awe. Every once in a while, you'd have somebody that took it it's less seriously than they should. They wound up paying for that a little bit later. But nonetheless, same thing. You know, I never realized what happened, what could have happened here, what I could have done. And you've turned things around. You know, I'm not a person that says you're bad if you drink. If you want to have a drink now, go ahead and have a drink now. Don't go out and drink and drive. But you know, what you do in your personal life is your business. Just don't hurt anybody while you're doing it. I, you know, I'm not a, a prohibitionist or anything like that. But these people realized. Yes, and they may continue to drink, but it's not going to be before they get into a car or a truck or some other type of motor vehicle and drive away. I represented somebody on a lawnmower. He probably couldn't have done much damage, but nonetheless, you get my point. So people that way liked it. Uh, the DWI, was something else I did on DWIs was two other things I did. One, the state police shot it down. We did it as long as we could was the blood test instead of the breath tests. I applied for a state grant and everybody approved it but the state police. Why wouldn't the state police approve it? Because they're the ones that take care of all the breathalyzer tests and provides them, the machines. Yeah. So they didn't want to give that up. But it was a great program. You got arrested for DWI. We didn't say blow into the machine. We were coming to the hospital and we're taking your blood. And it was a very simple 
thought in my mind as to why you do that. And it's very simple. I do this whenever I'd have a DWI trial when we had the breathalyzer. If I had a client call me and say, what do I do? I'd say, tell them you want a blood, blood test, not a breath test. And the deputy or the local officer would always say, you know they're not entitled to that. And I'd say, yes, but he's already told you he believes the blood test to be more reliable. And I think everybody believes that. The example to start that off in jury selection, by the way, would be you're buying a house that's serviced by a water well. You have two choices as to how to test the potability of the water. You can take a sample of the air off the vent pipe, or you can actually test the water. Which one are you going to have tested? Every person, I had no exception to this, every person said, I want to test the water. So I said, so then of the two, a breath test or a blood test? One is you test the breath of an individual that goes into a machine and is analyzed, and the other is the actual blood of the individual. Which of the two do you believe to be more accurate? Every one of them, to a person, said the blood test. And then the deputy or the officer would get on and said, did my client ask you for a blood test? Uh, yeah. What did he say at the time he asked for it? He said, I don't believe in the accuracy of breath tests, but I would accept the results of a blood test. And I said, would you agree that blood tests are likely to be more reliable than a breath test? Absolutely. That's it. Done with cross-examination. Done. And usually with a successful result thereafter, yeah, yeah. even with a breath test result. Yeah. So. So. At some point, you're the you're the DA, and during that time period, you had a few cases which were interesting, notable. Yes. You want to talk about a couple that are kind of? Yeah, the first one. They actually both happened when I was running for re-election in 1997. You want to talk about luck, I guess, or bad luck? I'm not sure. I enjoyed both of them. The first one was the individual's name was William Shank. William Shank was an individual who had been convicted of murder in Alabama after he had been convicted of burglary. So he actually had his trial for murder after he'd been sent to prison on the burglary. Mm. He's obviously convicted of the burglary, which is why he's in prison, but he gets convicted of the murder as well. As a result of that, he gets sent to prison for the murder. He has a seven-year sentence on the burglary and a life sentence on the murder. Well, Alabama officials, I still to this day do not know how it happened, but they let him go because he served his time in the burglary. So he comes up to Chautauqua County and Alabama on five different occasions tried to get him back through extradition and it never even made it to the appellate division. Judge Hartley in each of the cases ruled that it wasn't an escape, therefore it was not an extraditable offense, therefore he couldn't be sent back. And I'm not sure why it never got appealed, but it hadn't been. So it, they try one last time and I become the DA and I said, well, I already know what the result is going to be. I already knew what the major argument I was going to have to confront, which was it's race judicata. You can't do this anymore. It's already been decided. My answer to that, by the way, in the appellate division, because I did take it up on appeal, was I would agree with you that we can no longer, because it's now double jeopardy, it's already been decided, we can no longer contest or litigate the issue of whether or not he committed the crime of escape. But that's not what we're alleging here. We're alleging that his mistaken release and failure to return when requested is equivalent to an escape. And the appellate division unanimously agreed. Now, kind of a cute story, but Judge Doyle after that de developed, which I'm sure some of the people that will watch this will appreciate, Irish Alzheimer's, never forget a grudge. Because every time I saw Judge Doyle after that, that's the first thing he'd bring up, oh, you know they were wrong about that, they shouldn't have done that. And the interesting part, which probably really got him angry at me was, I had gone out with Judge Doyle maybe a month before that golfing with Judge Doyle, Judge Lamancuso from Jamestown. Um, I can't remember who the fourth one was, but another judge. Oh, Judge Cosgrove, and we're out golfing, and it's like every five minutes, Judge, uh, not Judge Cosgrove, Judge Doyle's phone is ringing. Not Judge Cosgrove did too, but Judge Doyle always stopped and answered it. So we're waiting, we're standing on the fairway, we're standing on the green, he's answering the phone. So we get the decision, and I thought what I'd do is the honorable thing. So I called Judge Doyle's office, and I said, I need to speak with Judge Doyle because I'd like to have him issue an order directing that the habeas corpus be rescinded and remanding 
Shank back to the Chautauqua County Jail. He, we can't find him. I know he's got his cell phone and he answers it all the time. He's ducking me. This happens the entire rest of the morning, which is probably mid-morning when I got the decision, through half the afternoon. I finally called the governor's office. I talked to governor's counsel. His name is Jim Duncan. I said, Jim, I'm going to do something that I'm probably going to wind up in jail for. I want your assurance that the governor will do whatever is necessary to, number one, get me out, and number two, keep my license. And he says, we've got your back. I then called the sheriff, his name was Ted Sexton, down in Tuscaloosa County, and I said, Ted, we got an order. I faxed it down to him, the decision. He booked it up here, straight up. Took him about 12, 14 hours or so. I mean, he's driving 90 miles an hour the entire way. They pick him up sometime like 2, 3 in the morning. They haul him down to Tuscaloosa. By the time the judge called me back and by the time the opposing counsel called me, it was, well, you know, I, I appreciate you calling me back, but I don't need you anymore. He's already down in Tuscaloosa County. They picked him up, and boy, were they mad. But, you know, I did what I could, and that, nothing ever happened as a result of it. So that was number That's one. That, oh, God, it was. Then number two is everybody knows and has heard of because it principally happened right around here, not literally in your office, but in the city of Jamestown. New Sean Williams. Mm -hmm. New Sean Williams, who spread, that was another one I thought I might have trouble with my license, but anyway, who spread HIV to over 50 different women. Most of them, when I say women, I consider females other than the infants women. So we're talking about women anywhere from 14 years old, usually up until the high 20s or so, that they are women. He spread HIV to over 50 of them. Now the problem with it is, is we're dealing with complex medical record legal issues. So what we have here is, number one, proving that he has HIV in the first place, which we can only get from his medical records, which of course he's not going to release to us. So, and then the other part comes a little bit later. So what we did, we made application to Supreme Court saying, you know, this is a public health crisis, this is an emergency, we need his medical records. So we get his medical records. And now we have question two. We need that same medical problem, the privileges, with the, you know, the confidentiality with the 52 women. I don't know who any of them are, not a one of them. So they go back, the social workers go back and talk to all 52 of them. Eight of them agreed to talk to me. The other 44 wanted nothing to do with this, absolutely nothing. So of the eight, one I'm golden on. She's 14 at the time it happens. So I've got the child sexual abuse laws, the statutory rape laws on my side, where I do not have to reveal her identity. All of the others, they'd ask the same question, and six of the others backed out. When they'd ask the question, I'm not going to lie to them, they'd ask the question, will my identity ever be known? And I said, I can keep it secret all the way through grand jury. If it gets beyond that point, I can't guarantee it. If it gets to trial, I assure you I can't. And they said, I'm not going to do this. I, I've got too much to lose by going out. Some of them were respectable women in the community. Well, we can't do this. I'm just not going to do this. It's not going to happen. So I had the one in hand, and then I got one other who would have been a horrible witness, just horrible. But nonetheless, she agreed to do it. So I've got two of them, and I approached Richard Slater, who was the public defender at the time, and we got him to agree to one rape second and one reckless endangerment second. We got consecutive seven-year sentences on both, on a plea to both. The interesting part would have been had we had to go to trial. There is a process. They call it phylogenetic DNA, but it's really not DNA. It is phylo, it's P-H-Y-L-O, dealing with class and that type of thing as opposed to, anyway. anyway. There are only two places in the country at the time that did this phylo G DNA testing. One was Baylor and the other was the University of Florida. Each sample that they tested was $25,000. So I'm thinking, let's see. I've got two women that I've got to test. That's 25,000 times two is 50. I've got to have him tested. That's another 25,000. Just to get the first three samples would have been $75,000. Do you know how much that exceeded my whole year witness budget by? Oh Tons, yeah. tons. I mean, we're talking about three years worth of witness budget all in one case. So I'm thinking, boy, this isn't going to be good. And then we're talking about science, you know, the, the Fry test. 
Is it generally accepted within the scientific community? I don't know the answer to that. If only two labs do it, I can't say with a reasonable degree of medical certainty, I can prove that those tests are going to get into evidence in the first place. And without them, I'm going nowhere. So when I got the chance to get 14 years in prison, we jumped on it. Everybody was happy. The eight that I talked to were happy. The two that were prepared to testify were happy. I mean, everybody was happy. I was happy. And he still, because of the mental hygiene law, locked up. And I'm not sure he'll ever get out. I'm not sure he's in a position anymore that he'd be doing the same type of stuff anyway. But nonetheless, took a very nasty case, very nasty individual, resolved it to the best way I could think of, got him off the streets, uh, made us relatively safe again. So I'm very pleased how that worked out. The interesting part about that as an aftershoot of that case, or an offshoot of that case, the Attorney General's office was looking at it at the same time I was. Dennis Vacca was the Attorney General at the time. Mike Kelly, he was an assistant attorney general, a friend of mine, very close friend of mine. Mike has since passed too, but he talked to Mike and he said, or Mike said, are you going to take the case or not? And he says, no, I don't think so. I don't think this case is going to do much because Dennis was big into publicity. Great lawyer, but was big into publicity. And then he kind of regretted letting it go after it got blown up all over the national news. I mean, every day I'm on national TV. My favorite story about that was when I was live on ABC News in the morning. I got to watch myself live on ABC News because it was 20 minutes after it was taped. But <laughs> it was, yeah, so anyway, Dennis is being interviewed on a national TV show and saying, do you regret not having taken over this case? Are you concerned about the prosecution? And again, Dennis is the opposite party of me. Right. Dennis and I were friends, but nonetheless, He's the opposite party of me, and I'm sure the people within his party were cringing when he said this because he knew I was running for re-election. But he says, no, nah, Jim Subject's an exceptionally fine DA down in Chautauqua County. I'm very confident he's going to do a great job. And I'm thinking, thank you on national TV for the endorsement, Dennis. Yeah. <laughs> so I wound up winning that election 63-37. So you uh, then, that's another four-year term. That was another four-year term. And... Um, who was the public defender during your time period? Is that Slater? That was Slater during that, and then it followed with Kevin Lahmer. Okay. And I got along very well with both of them, the utmost respect for both of them, both very good lawyers, very easy to work with. Uh, Richard and I had a little brush up with the issue of the drug court, but I, he never fought it after it got into existence, and I think he, he understood that it was a good concept, and the program as we ran it was good. So. How did it actually work behind the curtain? I mean, you're on the same floor. Mm -hmm. I mean, you got the DA's office, and you got the public defenders, and and then sometimes you actually uh, have guys that go from the public defender's office to the district attorney's office, and vice versa. And vice versa. You know, how did that sort of work? Was there a Chinese wall in all of this? No, not really. We had clearly the conflicts that we had to resolve with issues. Now, for example, somebody going to the DA's office from the public defender's office had to stay away for a while from those types of cases, could only take cases, for example. We'll say that on September 1st, they became an assistant DA, could only take cases from that day forward as opposed to taking over cases that a predecessor had that were being involved with the public defender's office and vice versa. Somebody becoming a assistant public defender from the DA's office would do the same thing. There'd be the conflicts there, but we always worked around them. The judges were very good in helping us work around them. The atmosphere between the two is very good. I, you know, we got along exceedingly well and I don't understand, and I'm sure you saw it in your career, there are sometimes lawyers take everything personally. And you know, if I'm doing my job, it's not directed to you or him or her. It's directed toward doing my job. Mm -hmm. Nothing personal about anything I've done. If I'm aggressive, it's because I think that's necessary for my client, whether it be the public, the state of New York, or a private client. I've got a job to do and I'm gonna do it. But I walk in as friends, I walk out as friends. And it had great relationships with all the assistant PDs. I could go over there and have coffee with Pauline Bush um, all of the people that were over there. I had no problem at all. Brian Taylor, the investigator, we got along great. Uh, there were really no secrets. We didn't hide anything from each other. Now, once we got in the courtroom, we were adversaries, but we shook hands on the way in, we shook hands on the way out, no matter what the verdict. And that's the way it should be. And again, I'm sure during the course of your career, you've seen lawyers that don't do it that way. I don't get it. 
I don't think I'll ever get it. They find a cure for death. I don't think I'll ever get it. But I was never that way. So we had great relations. I think I had great relations with pretty much all defense counsel, prosecution counsel. I mean, it is, there's no reason to be nasty toward one another. Again, in the courtroom, you're bitter enemies, but it's directed to only in the courtroom. So. Then you ran a third term. I did, unopposed the third term. Yeah. And that was kind of interesting because it just kind of surprised you at some point. You're a Democrat, you're the first Democrat, and all of a sudden, you kind of the, the wheel had turned so that you had opposition to all of a sudden you're running unopposed. Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Actually, what I'd hoped to have was uh, the cross endorsement of the Republican Party. I, for the first time, got the endorsement of the Conservative Party that last election, which I really didn't need, but I wanted it anyway. It was kind of interesting. Uh, I tried. Some, I actually went to see some of the conservative people, and they'd say, well, you know, well, we heard you really work hard. And I go, yeah, I say, I think I do. And you really get good results. And I says, yeah, I think I do. I says, isn't that the type of person you want as your DA? Well, no, but you're not a Republican. What difference does that make? You know, as far as local politics are concerned, I'm probably as close to you as you could possibly be. My national level politics and your national level politics are probably pretty far apart. But locally, we all have the same goal. We're all trying to achieve the same end. I mean, there, there's really not that much difference between us. So, but I, I didn't understand that. I still don't understand that about politics. So that part I, I, I didn't get. And, but Bert Snyder, I don't know if you remember Bert from, for, oh, yeah. Well, anyway, Bert finally comes to me and says, Jim, you've done a terrific job, and I can finally vote for you. And I said, what do you mean? He says, oh, I could never vote for a Democrat, but now that you're on the conservative line, I can vote for you this time. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Bert. I appreciate it. But uh, I got the line. Sandy Sopak and I became great friends. Right. We'd go out to lunch at least once a week together. People would stare at us and look at us and go, aren't they supposed to be bitter enemies? And it goes back to all politics is local, yeah, yeah. that we should get along. We have the same goals in mind. We have the same ideals. We have the same thoughts. She's a nice person. I think I'm a nice person. We thought we were nice people. So we always got together. We rarely discussed politics, except when it came to that election. We both said, you know, let's try to get the cross endorsement. Let's try to get our parties to cross endorse. And both parties said, absolutely not. We're not going to do it. We didn't need it. You know, as soon as I voted for myself, I knew I was going to win. And I did vote for myself. But as soon as I voted for myself, I knew I was going to win. Sandy knew she was going to win as soon as she voted for herself. But they never gave it. They did after we both left. But you know, it was nice. It was much easier. And then, I hate to say it, if you're wondering about the end of my DA career, the actual reason was I couldn't do it anymore. Everybody thought I made a lot of money. I didn't. I made much more money when I was in private practice. Now, at that point in my life, my daughter is going to Penn State a legacy, but legacies don't get financial assistance. <laughs> She's paying out-of-state tuition, or I take that back, I'm paying out-of-state tuition, which at that point with room and board is about $35,000 a year. My wife is going to Edinburgh getting her master's degree and paying out-of-state tuition. So pretty much two-thirds of my disposable income is going only to college tuition. And I'm thinking, I can't survive. And I really couldn't. I mean, it's getting to a point where as much as my people thought I was making my salary is 198. As much as people thought I was making, it was nowhere near what I was making. So I'd been for about a year talking with Paul Cambria up at Lipsitz Green, and they ultimately offered me a job, which I accepted. And I held off going with them for about, well, I left March 31st, so three full months before I, in fact, I knew before then I was going to go, but I told them I'd leave December 31st. Right. But I stuck it out till March 31st, trying to get things in order. And I'll tell you the things I did to get sure. things in order in a second. But uh, you know, I started off with an $80,000 raise before I started. And that made things much easier. I mean, it made much, much easier. So, And I, I had my own office in Fredonia. I was my own boss, even though I had accountability with the firm in Buffalo. I was still my own boss. I controlled where I went, when I went, how I went, who I took as clients, who I didn't take as clients. So it was a nice relationship for a while. I got tired of that after a while because I'd always been my own boss. And I was in Fredonia, but I wasn't. Within the hierarchy of Lipsitz Green, there were like, 10 or 15 people, they were it. And if they said jump, your responsibility was to say how high as opposed to how come. Yeah. So I, I got to a point where I couldn't do that anymore and I went back on, on my own. Um, but it, it worked out okay. 
So then you became basically criminal. I mean, that's been your career. Yeah. Criminal law. That's pretty much all I did after I got out. Yeah. And, um, and then you went until you went in by yourself. It was Jim Subject, mm -hmm. Esquire. Mm -hmm. And your offices were up in Dunkirk, weren't they? No, we were in Jamestown. Whereabouts? Uh, depends on when. <laughs> <laughs> they, they wound up. I started off in Tubi Scarpino's office. That was back in the 70s. When I was left the DA's office, I was in Bob Barger's building oh. at 4th and Pine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then what happened was is I bought into the Fenton building and my final offices were Howard Crosley's old offices because we merged with Howard Crosley. Yeah. And that yeah, was nice. Yeah. Walked down memory lane. Yeah, it was. So I had that corner office, which, had, which is where, I shouldn't say that they are, but Cassick succeeded me. I donated all my office furniture and things when I retired. I assume they're still there, but I don't know that for sure. So I shouldn't be saying that that's where Cassick is, but that's where they went. Yeah. So. We're going to show you, Jim, because you had a chance to intersperse with a lot of people. This is a 1987 mm -hmm. uh, composite, and what we've done to guys, just simply, you know, your eye flashes down, there may be a pause, you'd say, oh, let me tell you this story about it, or a vignette, or something. Oh, God. Uh, but let's start with Tubi Scarpino. Oh, so you my were God. in Tubi's office, I remember Tubi well, and you, of course, were in his office. So give, give me your a Tubi story, or a chronicle. Tubi was one of the most interesting people I've ever met. Uh, brilliant man but kind of crude at certain things uh, we'd always go to his house at the end of the day and he'd make old fashions uh, I didn't really like them but you had to have an old-fashioned with Tubi sit there and we'd talk and he actually got me on the right track because I'd go to him I say hey Tubi do you know what this should be and he'd say read the law so it got me to a point where I always went, you know, I did the five days a week, and then on Saturdays, early morning, I took appointments and got some dictation done. And then the rest of the morning into the early afternoon, I'd read advance sheets, things like that. So I, I read the law, and I knew the law, which was pretty important for being a lawyer. So, I, <laughs> so anyway, he got me to do that. We had some great times. It, I remember he got in a little bit of trouble. We kind of got him through that when... He shot at somebody out in his camp in Sherman. Yeah, New York. I yeah. That, we had a camp nearby. Yeah, well, uh, but that worked out pretty well. So, uh, but he, crusty old fellow, um, not afraid to use a salty word or two, or four or ten or twenty, but just the nicest man. I mean, I I think I know just about every one of these people. I'm trying to see if there's anybody I don't know. <laughs> I know them all. I don't know. I know some of them are no longer with us, which is unfortunate. Now, for example, Sam Alessi. A lot of people, the Jamestown police thought he was too soft. Sam Alessi to me, and I'd been to the Court of Appeals, I've been to the Appellate Division, county court judges in, I don't know, half a dozen counties. Sam Alessi to me was one of the best judges I ever had the pleasure of practicing in front. He, the same thing, X is the law, Y are the facts, Z should be the result. He was one of those guys, like I mentioned right at the very beginning, you know, Z doesn't have to be the answer. Z might be the logical answer, but the best answer is something other than Z. And he wasn't afraid to say, you know, I know what you're saying, I know what you think should happen, but I don't think it should be that way. And 99 times out of 100, Judge Alessi was right. He came up with the right conclusion, the right result, the right thought processes behind it, the right compassion that went into that decision. Just a wonderful man. And it was unfortunate that he passed, what, just a couple years ago, I think. That's too bad. Bill Harrison, did you pass across the hills? I did, but not very often. Uh, he was in the public defender's office when I was first in the DA's office but he handled all the felony cases. When I was first there, I was doing the misdemeanors. We'd run into each other at court. He was a legend, of course, because yeah. he, again, he knew how to cross-examine. He knew the questions to ask, how to ask them, when to ask, when not to ask, what to ask, what not to ask, which again is always very important. Brilliant lawyer, and one of those, again, that I'd watch and learn. I like that, I don't like that, I do like this, I think I want to do it that way. And again, 
I think that's very important. If you want to be a courtroom lawyer, is don't imitate somebody because you like who they are or their reputation precedes them. Like what they do and how they do it and how does that fit into the way you th do things. If it fits and it works, by all means, adopt it. If it doesn't, somebody else may do it a little bit differently and you say, you know, I like the way he or she does that. I'm going to adopt that. And you get your own hybrid style and it works. It should work anyway. It always did. You... No, go ahead. If you're on a roll, you had another name. Oh, God, all kinds of names. Dale Robbins, of course. Dale was the first major campaign contributor I had. Dale at the time was, this is my first election, was the chair of the Busti Republican mm -hmm. Committee. Mm -hmm. So when he sends me a fairly substantial check, I get, oh, my God. So what I did, as part of my strategy, I wanted to emphasize the law enforcement part of it, but I also wanted to stress that I wasn't just the Democratic hack candidate. So I got the law enforcement people. I had honorary chairs to my committee. They were every retired chief in the county. Mm -hmm. Every retired chief in the county agreed to be my honorary chair on the letterhead. Most of them were Republicans. Most people knew that, but they didn't care. They liked the way I handled things. They agreed to do it. So they did that. So the next thing that happens is I want to send out a, a letter a fundraising letter to both sides, to people on both sides. So Dale, of course, agrees to sign it. So what I do is, who is the Republican chair of the town of Carroll? Also a lawyer that I have nothing but the utmost respect, Paul Webb. Mm -hmm. Paul Webb's, I have no problem doing that. So I've got two Republican chairs in the county signing my fundraising letter when I'm running against the Republican candidate. They put their sign, my sign up in their office yards. I mean, it worked out real well. So I mean, I think I got some, I had to get some cross support in order to do that because at that time, and it still may be, I don't know, but at the time, this was a Republican county, so I could not have won without sure. Republican support. And I think having people like Dale and Paul behind sure. me worked out very well. I mean, John Goodell was always fun to watch. He always came up with some weird stuff. Sometimes he could be a little hard-headed. I mean, you'd say to him, John, it just isn't here. You, you shouldn't pursue this. And he'd pursue it to the bitter end. And uh, we, either a couple others I had do the same thing. I, had to, I was a law guardian for Judge Hartley one time, and there were two lawyers that were fighting over a case at this multi-day trial. And after the first day, I took them both aside and I said, neither one of you has proven anything. What are we doing here? One of them was, woman wanted to cut off all visitation because the child came home with diaper rash. And I'm thinking, you're gonna have to get some real expert medical testimony to say that it was his negligence that caused that diaper rash as opposed to something you may have done or something that was completely unrelated to both of you. And then he wanted custody because on the advice of counsel, inappropriate advice, by the way, but on advice of counsel, she said, you don't have to, because there's no signed decree, you don't have to give him visitation, even though they had agreed and stipulated in court that he was gonna get visitation every other weekend. So we went two straight weekends without visitation. Well, again, the lawyer was wrong. He's no longer a lawyer, by the way, appropriately so. and. I, after the first, I said, you've got nothing here. Judge Hartley thought long time before he'd issue a decision normally. The, after the second day of trial, I went home dictating my report. Because it was in Mayville and I lived in Jamestown. By the time I got back to Jamestown, I was done with my report, handed it to my secretary the next morning. It went out that day. Within three or four days thereafter, business days thereafter, Judge Hartley rendered his decision dismissing both petitions. I'm thinking, what are you people doing? Why are we doing this? Now, think about what you're saying. You're, you're, well, anyway, uh, there's just some great people here. Old Bill Duncanson was a good lawyer judge. Dick Fessenden, he's retired now, right? Right. That's right. Is Kevin retired? Yeah. He is? Cindy retired? Your wife? Well, no, for the practice of law, she she's owns a one of the owners of a family business. Okay. Ohio, yeah. Okay. Got it. Lived with Neil for a while. The Price Boys, the brothers. And of course, Paul. Jim Westman and I had our battles, mostly political. Doug Spoda was always interesting. I always joked, and I talked to the people, because I knew the people that worked for Spoto and Slater, and I said, now let me get this straight. Your holidays are half a day Christmas, and... 
<laughs> I don't think they were kind of stern taskmasters, if I recall correctly. Yes, it was. But he, he's a he's a pussy cat now. Yeah, I'll bet he is. Yeah. Is Richard having any problems with the site? Has he gotten that corrected? He came in and, and he didn't seem to complain so much. He, he explained that he's been having some issues with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I thought he was going blind there for a while. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, he came in. Came in and talked, and so I've been. And everybody's had a good time. We've had a couple of setbacks, and I, I, I want to say this to the very end because you don't know this probably. Paul Webb died today. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. So uh, that uh, he had a he had had a brain uh, aneurysm. He'd been in the hospital in Hammett, and it was coming back. It was on the upgrade uptick until yesterday. He had a blood clot in his leg, and it went up to his heart, and we lost him today. I mean, this is. Ran wow, news, so. that's terrible. Yeah. And I just got done talking about him. I wanted to not dull. I didn't want to dull your memories by memory of Paul, but uh, because of that. But yeah, um, also I, I had interviewed him just a few months ago, and everybody was thrilled that we did what we did. Mm -hmm. and that's not why we do it, but it's getting there. It's going to happen. Well, for all of us. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Nothing we can do about it. Yep. And uh, is your Kind of you look at that, and we've just talked about your career, the arc of your career. Uh, is there sort of a Jim subject? I hate to use the term legacy, but as you look at some of the things you accomplished, you've, and you, you you reflect back now in retirement, uh, that you say at least as as if a newer attorney or younger attorney was looking at this, say, "Gee, Jim subject was a 12-year district attorney." What did he really do? What did he accomplish? What did he leave? You know, that type of thing. Have you ever thought about that? I, I don't know. I, I've got to believe that I made life better for a lot of people. The people I represented, that I'm sure you've heard of National Association of Distinguished Counsel, based on client reviews, it's the top 1% in the country. I'm in it. Mm -hmm. And my clients love me mostly because I was very fair price-wise. I should have charged a lot more than I ever did. I never charged more. I never charged anything for trial. So I, mean, I saved people's jobs because they did stupid things, but I'd get them off after a trial. Uh, I can't think of, I don't know if I lost any trials after 2007 and I didn't retire till 2015. So I saved a lot of people's lives that way. Uh, you think about it, they have a good paying job and the next thing you know they're going to lose it and you maintain it for them. It turns their lives around, but it gives them the second chance that they thought they'd never get. I think the status of law enforcement and the state of law enforcement certainly improved when I was DA. They certainly were better prepared. I always prepared my witnesses, whether it was defense witness or prosecution witness. Remember at the beginning I said the key to success is preparation, preparation, preparation. On the serious trials, on the murder trials that I'd have, I would meet with my witnesses, obviously for grand jury, and then at the beginning of the investigation. But then as it's getting closer to trial, three months before, two months before, one month before, two weeks before, two days before, one day before, and then a real brief the day of, I would never give them a list of questions because that's too easy to sidetrack. You would tell them the topics that you're going to cover, ask them what do they remember about this, what do they remember about that, tell them how they should handle cross-examination. Then I think we had some remarkable success. There was one trial I can still remember. There's a golf tournament called the Kendall Club Golf Tournament. It's the third Friday in June. We were in the process of trying a defendant called Ingvi Buchanan big, massive man for killing a girl. All we had was some circumstantial evidence. So at the tournament, John Ward, who was the judge presiding, he was at the tournament too, said, Jim, I think you've done a really nice job, but I don't think you've done enough. Now, I'm sure you know, but the, the standard of proof, it's not reasonable doubt in a circumstantial evidence. You have to disprove to a moral certainty every hypothesis but guilt. That is a daunting task. So I thought about it. I thought about it over the weekend. We aren't going to resume till Tuesday. I thought about it and I said, you know, Paul Webb was on the other side. Paul Webb and Loyal Haidu were on the other side and they in their opening and were talking about, you know, circumstantial evidence cases like a jigsaw puzzle. Every piece has to fit exactly and if it doesn't, you have to acquit. So I thought about it and I called Vince Gerasi over at the Sheriff's Department. I said, Vince, I've got an idea. And he said, what's that? And I said, I want you to do a PowerPoint 
making a jigsaw puzzle. And he says, what the hell are you talking about? And I said, I've got these pieces of evidence. And I want them one at a time as I push a button to come in. And one of them will be uh, tire prints. Another will be footprints. Another will be shoes found in garbage. And they all went together. After the third piece came together, Ingvi understood what was going on. And the courtroom is quiet. I mean, it's really quiet because the jurors are actually intent on watching this. And Ingvi goes, oh, shit. <laughs> Loud enough, I think, for everybody to hear it. And as the pieces come together, ultimately, it's a picture, not in jail clothes, because you don't want to prejudice the jury, but it's a picture of Ingvi Buchanan. It comes together, and then they, and it's him. And then the lines in the jigsaw puzzle disappear, and it says, guilty, murder second. The jury was out less than four hours on a circumstantial yeah, yeah. evidence case. That case got reversed by the appellate division only because I thought it was a stupid decision because it wasn't the law before. The sheriff's department had some real problems because Ingvi was very strong, massive, threatening. They made him wear a shock belt. And they said John Ward should have made hit or should have had a hearing to determine how that would have affected his performance in trial. Mm. And they didn't have a hearing, so they said it has to go back. Now, I think that was a stupid decision because to me that was harmless error because he participated just fine, as everybody could attest. But when it went for a retrial, the jury was out for two days and it was hung. So I'm thinking, I got a conviction in less than four hours. In two days, they couldn't get anything. So yeah. he wound up pleading guilty to manslaughter. And he's probably out now. Hopefully, he doesn't know I'm here. <laughs> one, of the, one of the highlights of my career, I joke about this, but he, when he was coming back on all of his motions, I was interviewing somebody in the holding part of county court. And I say, hey, Pete, that was his nickname. He says, hey, Pete, how's it going? And he says, subject, you're an mf -er. And I said, oh, God, you made my day, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> the recognition. Yeah. So I don't know. I like to think that I've changed some lives for the better. Mm -hmm. I like to think that I improved law enforcement at least for a while. I'm happy with what I did. I have no regrets whatsoever. I think everything I could have done, I've done. Everything I wanted to do, I've done. Uh, I can't think of anything I could have done differently, should have done differently, would have done differently. It's just, it was a, an honor, a privilege to be people like you and all the other lawyers that I dealt with. Now, we never faced each other in court, but we always had mutual respect for each other. I respected your ability, your intelligence, your personality, and I presume you did the same with me, and that's the way it should be. And I've, it was a 40-year career I really enjoyed. We'll keep that part in. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Did you, was there ever, uh, uh, you know, your district attorney, your prosecuting, and of course the uh, uh, defendants can pick anybody they want, it doesn't necessarily be the public defender, where you, they pick somebody and the performance was such that you'd say, that was really good. It might have been a local guy, it might have been somebody who came in from afar. Uh, did you have a, 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 a certain individual you'd say, they were very good at what, they're very good at their practice. There were plenty that were pr plenty good, and it wasn't just criminal practices. You could see Dale, for example, real estate, fine. You on business, uh, fine. Uh, so you look at some of these lawyers in their own fields. Now, there's some I wouldn't want have go to, I wouldn't, there are a lot of these lawyers that I'd say, you're way out of place in a criminal courtroom stay away from being in a criminal courtroom. And they did for the most part. The scary part was when some of these people would get a client and instead of saying, you know, I really don't want to handle this, you should see or talk to so-and-so. And then you watch them in court and say, oh my God, this is a travesty of justice. You know, this is why they hate lawyers. And one of the things getting and diverging away from our topic, I think one of the worst things that ever happened to the legal profession was allowing us to advertise and the reason I say that is if you well, there's no such thing as phone books anymore but back when I was practicing the yellow pages every lawyer not everyone most every lawyer handled real estate wills and personal injury handled divorces and personal injury half of those lawyers wouldn't know personal injury if it happened to them so they wind up taking the case and they wind up blowing it and all lawyers are bad as a result of a bad result from a lawyer that should have not have done that and made a bad decision. Yeah. So a lot of them shouldn't, but in their own fields, they were really well. There's no better 
municipal attorney I've ever met than Rick Sotir, the city attorney of Jamestown. I was assistant corporation counsel for a few years. Rick did a wonderful job for the city and you know, spent far more hours than for what he got paid. So I, mean, I can mention a good thing about pretty much every one of these. There's a couple I might not, and I won't mention them, but for the most part, I'd say they are all in their own field, terrific people, did terrific jobs, and really had their clients' best interests at heart. This is great, Jim. This has been really fun. Good, it has been. It has been for me. Yeah, it's gonna walk down memory lane. Yeah, I don't get to do that very often.